I don't know how, I don't know when, but I will own a Gibson Dave Grohl model. I'm manifesting this. I'm putting it out there in the universe. That guitar has always been and will always be my dream guitar. Since my last video, I've been searching. Searching for a deal. Searching for an opportunity. Searching for my dream guitar. After four months of scouring every online resource that I could find, I came across this. Let's take a step back. If you're new to the channel, let me introduce myself. My name is Jeech. I make videos about guitar and music and stuff. And in my last video, I was talking about my dream of someday owning a Gibson DG335 Dave Grohl signature guitar. See, I'm obsessed with the band Foo Fighters. You know, Foo Fighters, the mainstream, fun-loving dad rock band fronted by America's sweetheart, Dave Grohl. Yes, Dave Grohl, the nicest guy in rock. He just exudes a positive energy. He would never do anything to tarnish his perfect, spotless, squeaky clean reputation. Sorry, what's that? He what? Ooh. Look, it's been a tough couple months for Foo Fighters fans, all right? <laughs> I, dude, I'm not gonna talk about it. I, it's not, none of my business, but needless to say, it sucks. I'm still a fan of the band though. And specifically, I'm still a fan of that guitar. I think that Pelham Blue DG335 is the coolest looking guitar in existence and I still want one. So for the past four months, I have been searching for one of these. And the problem is they're just really, really, really expensive. If you haven't seen my last video yet, please go and check that out. We do a total deep dive on the history of the Dave Grohl signature model. And uh, more recently, the Epiphone guitar that was just released with all of his specs that I got to try out and ultimately decided I wasn't a big fan of. So the search continued for a Gibson version of one of these guitars and for a long time, it was a pretty fruitless search, until recently when I came across this listing on Reverb. Now, to the untrained eye, this is a Gibson DG335, right? It's Pelham Blue. It's got the diamond F holes. It's got the split diamond inlays. And it has the six in a line Firebird headstock. Basically, for all intents and purposes, this is a Gibson DG335, but it's not, and that's weird. Here's why. If you email Gibson, the custom shop, right now and say, hey, I'm gonna throw $10,000 at you, I want you to make me a one-off custom DG335, they won't do it. Gibson has a rule in place that says they will not custom build any guitar that matches closely the same specs as a recently released artist model. And this is to preserve the collector's market because if they suddenly just start pumping out more of these DG335s, then the guys who are sitting on them and trying to get $20,000 for their guitar, they're gonna get a little bit mad. So even though Technically, this shares all the same cosmetic appointments and all the same specs as the DG335. This is listed as a custom shop Trini Lopez reissue. If you remember from my previous video, we discussed all the similarities and the differences between Dave Grohl's signature model and the standard Trini Lopez guitars. So that's why this one is really unique. And we'll dive into some of those specifics a little bit later, but there's some confusion there. So again, to the untrained eye, it looks like a real Dave Grohl signature model just without the signature. And without the $10,000 collector's premium attached to the price. So how does this exist? The secret is the international market. Gibson sometimes makes what they call pre-sold limited runs of these guitars that are shipped out to international music retailers, specifically the Japanese collector market. They get all these cool guitars that us in the States aren't able to buy new because there's a huge collector's market over there. So for whatever reason, one of the Japanese music stores was able to order a limited run of this guitar and it changed hands a few times and suddenly 
ended up for sale. I wasn't even aware this guitar existed until a couple years ago when I saw a couple listings for these pop up on Reverb. And every time I saw them show up, they were selling for between seven and ten thousand dollars, and they were all located overseas, somewhere in Japan or Europe, UK, wherever. So when I came across this listing during one of my weekly searches for Trini Lopez DG335, for this price, I nearly jumped out of my seat. This is crazy. It was posted by a store in Canada called Music City Canada, also called London Guitars in London, Ontario. So immediately I got to work. I was like, I have to, I have to own this guitar. There's a couple problems here. First of all, where the hell am I gonna come up with that kind of money? And secondly, it's located in Canada and I'm in the States. I've never imported a guitar before, so this might be a little sketchy. So we're gonna take this journey together. We're gonna see if it arrives, and if it does, we're gonna do a review. Spoiler alert, of course it's here. You clicked on the thumbnail, let's go. Okay, so on to the tasks at hand. First of all, how am I gonna come up with $4,800. Well, if you're a musician like me, and especially if you're a guitar collector like me, you know there's usually one way to get the cash for a new guitar, and that's unfortunately to liquidate some of your other guitars. Now, if you've seen my videos before, you may recognize the red Gibson Trini Lopez that I've had featured. Beautiful guitar. It was a 2014 model, one of 250, limited edition, Memphis run, super sweet guitar. It was the first opportunity I had to own a real Gibson Trini Lopez, and I had it for a long time. Listen to me, speaking in past I'm still so sad about this, but it was a red one and as we'll discuss later One of the things that I didn't care for about that guitar so much was the trapeze tailpiece on it Anyway, it was always kind of in the back of my mind if I was able to come across a real DG 335 for the right price or even a Pelham blue Trini Lopez It would probably go on the chopping block but yeah, we were able to make it work in a very short amount of time because I knew that this specific guitar at that specific price was not gonna last on the market long. And I just gotta say, Music City Canada, absolutely outstanding shop to work with. The guys were so helpful, so just stereotypically Canadian. Like, <laughs> the most friendly, upbeat, positive guys during the customs and import process. We ran into some snags there and they were super helpful. So I wanna shout out Matt at Music City Canada. Thank you so much for making this happen. On to task at hand number two, getting this guitar from Canada to me in the United States. So I was informed by the guys at the store in Canada that they ship stuff to the United States all the time. It's not gonna be an issue. There's some paperwork that they need to file, import duties and customs, stuff like that. It's ridiculous, it's such a headache. They sent all the paperwork and gave me a tracking number within the first day that I ordered the guitar, which was fantastic. I noticed after a day or two that it was sitting in customs in Detroit, Michigan, uh, for a few days and then a week and then 10 days, and then two weeks. And I was like, yeah, this is weird. So I reached out to Matt again at Music City Canada and I said, hey, do you have any updates on this? And he informed me that unfortunately along the way, the paperwork that was attached to the guitar was lost by UPS. Womp womp. So Customs had reached back out to Music City Canada and asked for them to resend the documents because they lost them. There was some back and forth and stuff and also they needed to get some information from me and it was taking a long time and eventually, UPS just sent the guitar back to Canada. Really frustrating stuff. It sounds like what happened was, since the paperwork was lost, it took them too long to get all the information they needed and they just auto-kicked it back to Canada. So once we got that cleared out, they sent it back to me again, and luckily, the second trip, it made it here no problem. But all in all, it was stressful, uh, no fault of the music store that sent it, just customs and UPS stuff. But it finally arrived and now it's time to do our unboxing. So join me, will you? It's finally here. Oh man. I'm a little nervous because it seems a little flimsy, so I can see all of the paperwork that was sent to clear this through customs. Toxic Substance Control Act certification. No toxic substances. Let's do some unboxing. Ok, 
Okay, we're going handheld here. Not super impressed with the case right off the bat. The latch, I've heard this is an issue with these custom shop cases. That latch isn't really latching anything. And this latch is missing. So that's not very cash money. The other two latches appear to be fine though. So not gonna pitch a fit about that, but we might need to find a new case. Okay, here we go. Time for the official reveal. This is the first time I've opened the case. Uh, let's see what it looks like. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> Deep breath, everybody. Oh my God. Oh my God. It even has a watermark. Wow. That's heavy. It's finally here. Let's take a look. Uh, yeah, first of all, gorgeous. Oh my God. Not to be dramatic or anything, but this is maybe the most beautiful guitar I've ever laid my eyes on and it's mine. <laughs> Sorry, freaking out a little bit. Um, color is beautiful. Uh, if you watched my last video, again, you'll know that I had a big problem with the color of the Epiphone DG335. Pelham Blue is a hard color to get just right, but when you do, Dude, look, look, just look at it. It's beautiful. It's got the nitrocellulose finish on it, uh, which is very comfortable in the hands. Uh, that was another thing. The polyurethane on those Epiphones is just, feels like plastic and it affects the playability. I'm not one of those guys that believes like the finish of a guitar affects the tone. It's more the feel and, and how it plays and feels in the hands. And like I mentioned in the last one, the nitrocellulose finish on a Gibson guitar makes it feel like a nice guitar. It just feels different in the hands. Okay, so let's run through some specs here. Uh, this has custom buckers, which is slightly different than the Gibson Dave Grohl and the Epiphone Dave Grohl. The DG335 comes with burst bucker one and two or burst bucker two and three, depending on which run you get. These are the Gibson custom buckers. They are unpotted and they're, I wanna say between seven and eight K ohms. So not super high output, but God, they sound good. Holy cow. Really great pickups. ABR1 bridge, just like the DG335, and this. This is the big difference. Check out the tailpiece. Okay, like I mentioned before, the big difference between a DG335 and a Trini Lopez is the tailpiece. On the traditional Trini Lopez guitar, they have the trapeze. The issue that I have with that is a trapeze tailpiece sets the strings further back from the bridge. So there's much more string here leading to the tailpiece. Does that make sense? You can see it in the photo. Two problems with that. Number one, your brake angle over the bridge saddles is much shallower. So the string response doesn't feel as tight. It's a little bit looser. And if you're really digging in, if you're playing some heavy riffs and stuff, one of the problems I encountered with my old Trini Lopez was I would pluck the string so hard it would pop out of the bridge saddle because there wasn't enough downward pressure on the bridge. The other problem with the trapeze tailpiece is that with all that extra string length there, if you do like a quick, if you hit the note real quick, you get all this like sympathetic ringing behind the bridge because there's all this extra string length there. So I used to stick a piece of foam under the strings 
on, uh, on my old tree. So I can only assume when Dave was specking out his signature model, he requested a stop tail bridge for the same reason. That's why this guitar is so unique, is most of the time the Trini Lopez reissues don't have the stop tail piece. That's what makes this so similar to a Dave Grohl model. The other thing that's different, and this is something that's taken me a little while to adjust to, the neck on this is very thin. I'm a big guy, I have big hands. I prefer guitars with a really thick, chunky neck. The Gibson DG335 and the Epiphone DG335 both have really big, thick necks. This is more like a traditional 60s style Trini Lopez. So it has a thinner neck profile and it also has a thinner nut width, which means the strings are a little bit closer together. I would say that's the one spec that I'm not as excited about. I wasn't expecting that because uh, I played some of the other Trini Lopez reissues that had been released recently and they have thicker necks on them. So I was expecting this to be a little bit of a thicker guitar neck, but it is very thin. Still extremely comfortable to play. The setup on this is immaculate. The truss rod is completely straight. The action is nice and low, just like how I like it. And it's smooth, easy to play. Great playing guitar, great sounding guitar. I wish the neck was thicker, but every other spec on this is exactly the way I want it to be. The one other thing that is slightly different from the original Dave Grohl model, binding on the F-holes. They did include this on the Epiphones, but on the original 2007 and 2014 runs of the DG335, they don't have the binding on here. Kind of a neat spec. I sort of like it, especially now like holding it in my hands and like seeing photos of it up close. Like, it's blinged out a little bit more. I think the binding is, is pretty classy. The condition of the guitar is near mint. There's a couple of super light scratches in it. The other thing that's kind of weird, if you look on the back of the headstock, there's this slightly discolored spot right on the top. And I think what happened is whoever owned this guitar previously was using a headstock clip-on tuner and left it on there and it reacted with the nitro finish. So nitro finishes are great. They feel great. They're on really nice guitars, but they're a little bit touchy, so it's got this kind of spot here. Doesn't bother me. Uh, if you look real close, I don't even know if I can get this on the camera, but there's also like some stand rash on the back of the neck somewhere. I think it's actually down here. Where it's slightly discolored, but I'm not concerned. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> I'm not worried about any of it. I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about any of it. Another thing that is very slightly different, and this was the same with my old Trini Lopez. This is the 64 reissue, which means that the body is built to 60s 335 specs. Now a 60s ES335 is a slightly different shape than the modern ones. The horns up here are a little bit sharper. They're not quite as wide or round. I've heard people refer to like the 50s style with the wider ones as the Mickey Mouse ears. And these are a little bit sharper, a little bit more pointed. I think overall the body might be just a little bit smaller than a modern 335 um, and like the top carve is a little different, but it's still about the same size and shape. Like I said, this isn't exactly a DG335, but it's a real Gibson and it has all of these specs. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's what I was looking for. So now let's talk about comparison. What's this? <laughs> this is my Chinese copy of a DG335 that I've had for a few years. We talked about this a little bit in my last video and I've made several videos about this guitar before because back in the old days before Epiphone gave us an affordable version of this guitar, the Chinese counterfeit market was the only place you could find a guitar that had these specs. So uh, we're gonna do a little shootout here.
just taking a look at some you know quick differences here first of all the color that Gibson Pelham blue everyone struggles to replicate it even Epiphone shape of the body you can see this one has the slightly wider set horns than this one again that's the 60s style reissue body headstock shape didn't quite get that right that's real common with any sort of chips and quality service stuff but playability wise you know there's just there's no comparison I mean it's legitimate real Gibson versus counterfeit and like okay how do I say this without sounding like an ass like I'm comfortable enough with my ability to play fairly well on just about any guitar. I mean, if I have, if I can get this set up at least halfway decent and put some decent pickups in it, I can make this sound pretty good. From a purely comfortability standpoint, like the Gibson is, is just much better. And like you can play even that much better with a nice guitar. But you know, comparing the two side by side, it's it's very obvious there, there are differences in the quality of construction and the quality of the components, even though I've replaced a lot of elements on this guitar. This just has a better sound and a feel and look, if we're being honest. Oh my God, Jeez, shut up and just play the guitar. Yeah, that's right, I see you. I see you. I'm putting a timestamp here because I know you guys are just gonna skip all the yapping and just wanna hear me play it. So here we go. All right, let me give some closing thoughts here. I'm still so undeniably stoked to finally have this. And we're calling this my dream guitar with a tiny asterisk because again, this is, for all intents and purposes, this is 
a DG335, but just with some very slight, subtle differences. Someday down the road, if I find myself in a position to be able to get a real one, then I'm gonna jump on it. But for the time being, it seems like this is the closest I'm gonna get without spending an irresponsible amount of money on a guitar. And some would say that this was an irresponsible amount of money to spend on a guitar, but for what it is, um, I'm, I'm really happy with the purchase. You know, there's a couple things that I would prefer a little different, maybe the shape of the neck, but it plays amazingly well. It sounds great and it looks awesome. Thank you everybody for watching again. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't. I know my upload schedule is very sporadic and uh, not very consistent, but I always enjoy the opportunity to do these slightly more long form projects and everything. So thank you again so much for tuning in everyone and we'll see you in the next one.